Stop yawning. Might ditch this for now. Uh, let's just use that on. Hold on. Then it's gonna. Try out this um, tutorial. <laughs> and we're using a number normal pawn. So once it's done compiling, we're going to jump in Visual Studio. property, which means we can edit that s spring arm component component anywhere, including the uh, Unreal Editor, um, even though it's defined in code, um, or declared in code, rather. Um, I'm not sure if that property also applies to the camera component here. So we're just doing a normal spring arm camera thing to make a camera that can lag behind the actual actor. Still compiling. Oh, oh no, it failed. But I think it already makes it pop camera yeah just for some reason it fails to um compile it after it creates it so well it'll it'll get in there once we um build here uh, so i already have a little project going um i've been starting with uh, some basic tutorial stuff I'm starting to get to like the more intermediate tutorials. Um, so now we have this. Um, let's see what this is. This tutorial is actually doing. Um, activate a camera and change your active camera from one to another. And this is a player controlled camera. 
All right, so we are going to go into the header file for this pawn. Yeah, we're just gonna put it into this protected section. those. Okay, we're going to jump to the constructor and put them in there. Um, components. We'll just put all of our components below this. Just make it a big comment. Create default sub object, and create an object underneath this actor. Because it's our root component, we're just going to make it a seam component. Just kind of uh, not used for any game aspects. But we can attach stuff to it. That's what we're calling it over here. Camera sprint arm, yep. Hmm. Shift this. There we go. You can see a bit more of the uh, Jill Studio. So now we've attached the spring arm to the root component. Now that it has somewhere to be. Now we're going to um, define where it is in relation to that root component. So we're not just on top of the uh, root component. We're looking at the root component from an angle. some vectors in there. see that um, we put the two vectors in there you know the F vector for location the F rotator for uh, the actual rotation of the camera so now um, we're gonna be looking um, I think it's down from horizontal 60 degrees um, so it's more of a top down rather than a side front camera um, that's what those vectors will do Now to define um, what the arm length wants to be, um, because the spring arm is not a fixed arm, 
um, if you run in if the camera runs into um, geometry throughout the world um, it will condense down so that, um, it doesn't break sight with uh, what is connected to what the screen arm screen arm is connected to which is the root component um, and then I'll try to screen back to that um, this 400 Uh, camera enable lag will just allow it, the screen arm to um, lag behind the um, root component when the root component moves um, so it's not a jarring instantaneous uh, movement um, it's more of a fluid camera movement um, that's why we're kind of using the camera uh, screen arm so just a camera read this uh, this creates a basic empty scene component at the root of our component hierarchy then creates and attaches a screen arm component to it the screen arm is then set at a default pitch of negative 60 degrees that is 60 degrees looking downwards and at a position of 50 units above the root we also establish a few values specific to the screen arm component class that will determine its length and the smoothness of its motion uh, with that finish we simply need to create and attach a comp camera component to that socket um, on the end of the screen arm component as follows. So we already declared our camera in our header file. Um, so we don't need to declare a new one. But now we can define it as um, sub-object of this actor. just going to attach it to um, the screen arm directly because the screen arm has a socket already on it um, that will help define the position sockets are uh, an easy way to connect um, components together I'm not sure if you can combine different actors together to using uh, sockets I haven't gotten that far yet. For instance, you know, if you're playing um, Katamari Damacy, uh, you know, if you have your character as an actor, but then you have like NPCs in, as an actor, you maybe can connect them together with sockets or something like that. Alright, so now um, we're going to allow the player to immediately take control of this act or this pawn um, so that the inputs are automatically received once it uh, is spawned Let's build this um, just to make sure it's working. I just build the, the disco project, which is my uh, it's the project that I'm using right now. I'm not sure if I'm gonna make like an actual game based around um, what I'm doing here. Uh, basically, my goal is to make a um, at least prototype a a game where it's basically a marble game if you've seen like marble madness or whatever like on the xbox live arcade game um let's 
So let's make sure our uh, pawn got in here. Where is it? Pawn with camera. So that's the work we've done so far. So down here is the root component, and attached to it is the arm. Uh, that's what that is. So I guess um, the position that we gave it, the, uh, the location that we gave it, um, you can see it's, um, maybe you can't see it. Yeah, um, it's 50 units above it. So that's why it's up there. Um, and also, um, at the very beginning, we uh, we put in also up here U property and edit anywhere on top of the screen arm component. So if we click on screen arm, we are able to edit its values directly from here. Um, so that's what the U property does. Otherwise, um, if you look at the game camera, it says native components are editable when declared as a U property in C++. Um, so it did not apply to the camera down here, only um, you know what was within the semicolon, basically. So if you want to edit your camera as well in um, the Unreal Editor. I wasn't hiding this. This is what I was showing. The native components are editable, editable when declared as a U property. That will come in. Otherwise, you can edit it and nothing would grayed out. If I wanted to, I could um, increase the value to 100. It puts it back up there, bring it back down to 50. Um, and, you know, pitch, I could change the pitch. Uh, so, yeah, zero is um, that, but we want to go negative 60, you know, which is, where is that, 300? That's basically where we're at. Yeah. So that's, you know, pretty basic pawn so far from what I can tell. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move on to the next step. All right, so we need to decide what our camera controls will do. Um, and then set up inputs accordingly. For this project, let's allow our follow distance to shorten and field of view to zoom in when the right mouse button is held down. Um, so kind of like a, just a I don't know, like third person zoom in control. That's what it sounds like. All right, let's also control our viewing angle with the mouse and our pawn's movement with the WASD keys. To do this, we'll open the project settings and from the edit drop down menu in the Unreal Editor. I'll click on project settings. I already have some controls in here, so I'll just uh, overwrite them. Um, well, now I can't see where the input is. So you have to go over here under engine. There's the input section and it gives you the list. And, uh, we have one action mapping. Um, and then we're going to name this zoom in. So that's going to be our right mouse click. So let's go to mouse and then mouse right button. It's right here done with the actions now our axes okay so we move forward W S move right a D yeah make sure you have the um, scales when you're doing controls like this correctly you know if you're saying move forward W is gonna be forward so it's gonna have positive you know backwards it's gonna have negative say for right moving right you're gonna use D to move right so I have positive on D negative on a uh, so that's all right. Camera pitch. So they use different terminology here. So let's go with that camera pitch. Mouse X and a mouse Y. So we'll just put that right there and switch this to mouse X. So it matches. There. Set up. 
camera. Yeah. Alright, that's all we need to do. Close that so the mapping is now correct. Um, no need to just uh, be able to use those controller and mouse inputs, keyboard inputs in the actual pawn. So, let's move on. There's no code changes. Ooh, all right, our game now has input mappings that we can use. So let's set up some member variables to store the data we receive. During our update, we'll need to know the values of our movement and mouse looking axes, each of which are two dimensional actors. We'll also want to know whether we should be moving toward or zoomed in or zoomed out view, and how far between those two states we currently are. To accomplish this, we should add the following code to our class definition in pan or pawn with camera. We're going to the Visual Studio, go into the header file, and we're going to put this in our publics. Factor uh, 2D because we're just going to assume we're moving on a 2D plane. I'm assuming. So we have to do with X and Y and then F vector 2D again because we're only dealing with pitch and yaw. No roll is. Uh, Uh, yeah, Dima, I was trying to learn um, blueprints. Uh, I was just getting kind of confused with how to do some of those very specific um, controls and stuff like that. Um, it was very quick to get something working really quickly with the blueprints. Um, I just didn't know how to get past, you know, the first step, basically. But thankfully, they have a lot more coding tutorials available unfortunately they don't have a lot of um, I don't know blueprint variable uh, tutorials that are easy to get into I guess I don't look too far into it um, I was looking at tutorials and they had something that I want to learn so I just went with coding but these tutorials are pretty helpful in holding your hand kind of step by step and kind of helping you to understand what's kind of going on here. Um, so the second step for this part, uh, we'll need to create functions to track our input. So let's add the following class to our class definition in the header as well. Uh, I'm just going to slap this above our variables. So it's next to our other functions. forward. Uh, they'll be called when we press W or uh, S. And this uh, parameter that we're passing in, this axis value, um, that's going to be between negative uh, 1 and 1. Basically, it's going to be 1 when you press W and negative 1 when you press S. So it'll know how to move forward. You know, do I move forward or backwards? Uh, same for moving right, just with A and D. Uh, camera is a little bit harder to uh, describe because it uses the mouse controls. Um, but by default, um, it works out okay. Um, I haven't messed with like camera sensitivity at all. Um, but I'm assuming it wouldn't be too hard. You would just basically add another um, parameter to this function uh, with, you know, a sensitivity multiplier. Multiplier. So if you wanted to double your camera sensitivity from your mouse, you would just do something like comma, you know, 2.0, and it'll double the sensitivity, so it move twice as fast. But the default um, uh, values that come from the mouse work out pretty easily for uh, standard camera controls. 
and since um, the action uh, mapping that we put in with just um, the right mouse button, there is no values like between zero or negative one and one. So let's just zoom in, zoom out. And now we're going to define these functions in our source file. Let's move this down a bit. We don't need that right now. <coughs> we're going to go below our existing functions. I'm just going to call these our input functions. So this is our W and S controls. So this movement input is the um, variable that we defined up here, the 2D. So it's going to be our X and Y in real space. Um, so we can access it, access the values of that vector, which is just two com combined numbers um, via calling X, dot X, and dot Y, which we can see over here. We got dot X and dot Y. Um, so we'll get X as our forward. Um, now this clam function, it basically tells um, whatever is inside of it uh, that we pass into, which is going to be the access value, which, um, as I said, it can be between negative one and one right now. Uh, but that's because we told it to be negative one and one. If you happen to, let's say you're using gamepad controls, um, it's not going to return one or negative one. It's going to return um, somewhere between uh, 0 and 1, for example. So, or negative 1 and 1, but, uh, you know, a default neutral stick is 0. So if you press the um, thumbstick up slowly, it's going to go from, like, 0 to 0.2 and then 0.5 then 0.7 up to 1.0. Um, so it's not a just instant 1. So um, if you wanted to, um, let's say... When you push the thumbstick up halfway, um, you want to move your character forward, for example. So, um, so it's a bit more responsive in the controls. Um, you know, if, if you had to force your character to move forward only when um, the value was one, which is like all the way forward, um, then it would take a while between your thumb moving forward and then the reaction from the character on the screen. Um, so you could clamp it, um, you know, let's say like negative, uh, well, negative 0 uh, 0.5 F to, um, 0 0.5. So, um, uh, if your stick is halfway between up or down, then start moving right away. Um, but since we're doing keyboard controls, um, we're going to clamp it to, uh, 1.0 anyways. Um. So that, that's also a condition where um, if you have multiple uh, key presses, um, let's say I want to map multiple mappings, like let's say I want to do keyboard and gamepad uh, controls. Let's say I press forward on my D-pad, or not my D-pad, um, on my thumbstick forward, um, I'm going to get a one in return because it's uh, completely forward. If I press W, it's going to add on to that, so it's going to be, um, you know, basically 2.0 for the uh, forward um, movement. And we don't want to move twice as fast if people are, you know, pressing gamepad and keyboard. So we're going to clamp it down so at most we can move one, you know, 100% of our movement. You know, we can't move 200%. So it'll keep it within our range, basically. Uh, so that's all we need to do for the actual movement because we're just uh, using that vector as a storage place um, so we fill it with the data we need to and a different function will handle that data to actually move the pawn I 
all that changes for move right is we're going to change from x to y camera uh, controls or inputs we are not gonna clamp um, this value uh, because you know if you're moving your mouse really quickly then your camera should move really quickly you know it shouldn't just like go at one unit per second you know if you moving your mouse at 20 units per second move the camera at 20 per units per second so uh, no clamping is needed here unless you wanted to put a limit on your um, camera movement which you may want want to depending on your uh, actual gameplay I guess a good example of limiting camera movement would be um, if you're doing like a shooter um, and you have a really heavy weapon that you don't want the um, player to turn around quickly, um, you could like clamp this down to, you know, two or something like that. And you'd move um, really slowly, even though like the player is moving their mouse really quickly. Um, so that is our um, our function for the axes. Now for the actions, since they're just um, one button press, no uh, value associated with it, just on or off. Um, not much goes into here. We're just gonna tell this um, true false variable that now that we're zoom, uh, we're calling zoom in. We're gonna set it to true. Just gonna copy this. Change it from zoom in to zoom out. Since we're zooming out, this is now false. And th that's our input functions. They don't do much. They just set up the data ready. Uh, well, they'd set up the data for the moment that it wants to act on it. So, let's read the tutorial. Um, we haven't done anything with zoom factor yet. That variable will be updated during our pawns tick function, since its value changes constantly over time based on the state of a button, which is the right mouse button in our case. So the zoom factor was just a float value. Um, so we can describe how far zoomed in we are and it's not really an input it's just a monitoring function or value that um, i'm sure they'll use later for determining um how far away we are so it knows how to how to handle something i guess all right now that we have the code that will store our input data we just need to tell unreal engine when to call that code Binding functions to input events for pawns is as simple as adding, adding binding code to a uh, setup player input component as follows. So this function is uh, put in here uh, immediately, or by default by Unity, because it's a pawn, which could be uh, controlled by a player, player. So it just puts this in here and calls super setup player input component, which means that um, uh, since this is a pawn is a child of an actor, I believe. Um, let's check. I think, yeah, well, th oh, that's, this class is a, um, is a uh, child of a pawn. Um, so basically, 
when this is called uh, for the specific um, actor. It's going to call uh, the, the same function, the same name, uh, one level above it. So it's going to call the A pawns version, which is, um, you know, the, uh, the game code, the engine code. Uh, that's something that's not in our hands, you know. Uh, I'm not even sure if a pawn uh, setup player input component would do anything. Let's see if we can even look at it. No, it's just taking us to pawn.h. I'm curious now. I don't think. Well, I'm pretty sure that the source code is included with um, the game engine. And, um, I think, uh, the Unreal, uh, well, Epic, I guess, because they're the makers of Unreal Engine, um, they have, like, some licensing or something like that, and, uh, I'm not sure, I didn't find anything, um, I'm not sure if they have some stipulation against editing their engine's code, um, yeah, I don't know, but at least it's free for people like us who are just, you know, doing little hobby things or small games. You know, if we're not making any money, we don't have to pay Epic at all, so that's very good. So this is basically how we tell that um, those inputs that we mapped in the uh, project settings, uh, basically where those inputs are going. Um, I always do this. Um, watch out if you're watching or um, following these tutorials on um, the Unreal website. Uh, they use input component, and um, if we look at their code base or their, their file, um, their setup player input component function, their parameter is called input component. So I think it's an earlier version of the engine where they didn't rename, um, they forgot, well, I don't know if they, well, I, th I would think this is from a newer version where they, it's named player input component instead of just input component. Um, so yeah, make sure you, you say player input component. I'm not sure what will happen if you just say input component. I think for me it's worked before, but it's just good practice to make sure that you, you're dealing with the right uh, variable. Anyways, um, so we take our input component, um, and we're going to use the bind function, and we're going to first bind the action, which is the right mouse button. And we have um, two basically, but they use the same uh, input. And we're doing that because we want to recognize if we're holding down the right mouse one or not holding the right mouse one. So we have two states basically. When we press uh, the button down, uh, we'll, this will be one action. So basically we're, um, we're binding to the event of that input and we're telling the game or the engine to call this function right here uh, palm with camera colon colon zoom in which we define below we're telling the game to call this function when the zoom in uh, key is pressed which is the right mouse button now the second event that we want to bind to is going to be uh, when it is released, of course, because it's the, the change of two states. Um, let me show you all the different um, states that inputs can be in. Definition. Um, 
So this is part of the enum e input event. So like we've seen before, we can press um, an input, we can release an input, we can repeat an input. I'm not sure what repeat necessarily is, but there's a double click. That's obvious what that means. Um, then there's the access event, which is just when an access changes, basically. Um, so if you're um, you know, on a keyboard, if you press W for instance, which we have to positive one, um, the access value would change from zero to one for that input. So then this event will be called, which we'll use this later. No, we won't. Um, when we bind to accesses, axes rather, they um, by default will use this event. We don't need to tell um, the action which event to listen to um, because there's no like equivalent on an axis, whether it's, you know, press or release. It's just a value. And then we have max. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly if this is used um, at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have yet to see uh, max used. I'm not sure what a, the maximum of a um, of like an action would be. It may just be um, a little placeholder in that enum just to know uh, how many um, events there are. So since we're um, releasing the right mouse button, we want to zoom out. So call the zoom out function when we release the button. So now we're going to bind the axes. Player input component. The function is called bind axis. We're gonna bind to the move forward first, which is connected to W and S. Just looks like this. And um, I'll streamline this a bit. So this axis is move right. So you can obviously see the benefit of um, naming your input. Uh, inputs rather uh, the same as your functions it's very easy to uh, know which function belongs to which input pitch camera pitch right yeah and this will finish up the binding, uh, I believe it should. All right. Um, yes, our six inputs basically done. Uh, finally, we can use those values in our tick function. The tick function is up here. This is called every frame. It's the internal game tick. Um, so we'll call or use those values in our tick function to update our pawn and camera each frame. Um. All right, the following code block should be added to a pawn with camera tick. That's right here. So we'll put a comment in here. Zoom in if zoom in button is down. Another little um, 
good thing to keep note of, which is I noticed is um, to reference uh, inputs, player inputs, as their names rather than the keys. Because obviously, um, if you say like zoom in if the right mouse button is down, if you happen to change from the right mouse button to the left mouse button um, later on in the project, or you end up adding um, like player mappings or player custom mappings for keys, then you know saying in this comment, you know, zoom in if right mouse button is down is relevant at that point. So um, it's better to name it or to reference inputs by their names, which you can control. So we have that um, Boolean true false variable to know if we're zooming in or not, which is changed from the zoom in button or the zoom out function rather. Um, so yeah, once since we've mapped zoom in to the right mouse button, we'll know when the mo right mouse button is pressed and released, which will call either zoom in or zoom out, which will change zoom zooming in to either true or false. And since this is called every frame, you know, that's basically how we, you know, we map uh, player inputs to game actions, you know, it's that kind of uh, succession of events. So we're going to set up uh, some data. Uh, which is a zoom vector to tell the camera, maybe, well, maybe the screen arm, how far or how much to zoom in. And here's where um, math is kind of important with uh, game development. Uh, since each tick is called every frame, um, the frame is only dependent on, you know, whether or not we limit the frame duration, you know, not the frame duration, but the frame um, differences between each frame. Um, and that time is um, not constant. It's going to be changing. So that's why we have an input here, delta time. It tells us how much time has passed since the previous frame. Um, so therefore we can basically tell how much time has passed in the game since we've, we've last updated our, you know, our movement and our camera position and stuff like that. Um, so we use delta time here and we divide by 0.5, um, which you can see here, zoom in over half a second. So if, um, if you're zooming in and, um, Let's see, uh, so delta time. If, for instance, you know, if it's a second, the time in between frames is a second, then um, we should update our zoom factor by a half, since we're moving at half a second. But let's say um, the time in between frames was half a second, then the zoom factor will be one, because in that half second, we'll move from no zoom in to a half unit of zoom in in a second or er, in a in a half second full unit in half a second is that right i think i said that right um and then once you get down you know let's say um it was uh point 0.1 seconds you know 100 milliseconds uh, in between frames um and then if we divide by half we'll get 200 um units or not 200 point 0.2 units of zoom um, over that 0.1 milliseconds. Yeah. Because we're doing one unit every half second. Or basically two units per second of zoom. If you're trying to think of it as like a velocity type of thing. Or not velocity, but... Um, well, kind of velocity. Because we're doing like, you know, if you're learning about velocity in school, you go, you know, meters per second. Well, it's just zoom units per second. So, you know, it can be hard to wrap your brain around some things, but, um, you know, if you kind of say it out loud, it kind of starts to make sense. All right. Let's move on. So 
So this will be when um, the zoom unit is false. So we're gonna zoom out and we're gonna zoom out slower than we zoom in. So we're moving a, a quarter zoom per second. type rather I'll put quarter of a second so now that we set up the zoom factor we're gonna uh, clamp it so that we don't over zoom at all zoom factor to either no zoom or just one unit of zoom so basically we'll just uh, we'll finish zooming in half a second and we're just uh, zooming out over a quarter of a second okay Trying to wrap my brain around this right here, right now, too. On our camera's FOV and our spring um, length based on zoom factor. So I've never messed with um, FOV before, so it'll be interesting to see how it behaves terms of the code that it's written. So our camera, field of view. We're gonna set that to, here's a new function for me, lerp. It is a, uh, let me get rid of this. The specialization of LERP template that works with Scalar registers. I don't I don't know what that means. It's a LERP. Alright. <coughs> Linear interpolation. The basic operation of linear inter inter <laughs> interpol interpolation, yeah, linear interpolation. I don't know why my brain stopped there for a second. Uh, between two values is commonly used in computer graphics. Okay, and that feels jargon is sometimes called LERP. A LERP. The term can be used as a verb or a noun in the operation. Example: Bresenham's algorithm LERPs incrementally between the two endpoints of the line. So between two values, okay. So in what context is that? So we're gonna tell it to deal with floats. F zoom factor. So it takes two floats as a range, performs a linear interpolation between two values, alpha ranges from zero to one. So I guess it has a default FOV of 90 and it'll, it'll basically lerp to 60 over zero to one. So if it's at 
you know, if we were looking at this picture, let's pretend, you know, this dot is uh, 60 and this is 90. Um, zero is going to be up here and then one is going to be all the way down here. So basically slide along this line from 90 to 60. So it's a smooth uh, transition in the FOV. But basically every frame it calculates a lerp. So it's not, you know, directly smooth. It has to jump between points every frame. You know, it may take, you know, 20 frames to get down to here. So there's going to be 20 points along the way as zoom factor changes from 0 to 1. You know, 0 0.1, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then it gets to 1 at 60. Okay, so I, I think I know what lerp means now. Interesting. I had a computer graphics class in college. I just didn't know that lerp is a, linter, is a linear interpolation, and a linear interpolation is what I just described. Cool. gonna do another lerp okay I, I can see how this would be very useful this lerp um, stuff because changing from one value to another value smoothly where every frame calculates stuff instead of being able to do it smoothly you need to do it by bit by bit so lerp is used. Okay. It is now understood. So we just use it again for the spring arm. So we move the camera closer as well. So we set the um do, do, do. I was going to say, um, we set the spring arm to a max length or a target length of 400. Um, back up. That's what that function looks like. Um, back up here. Target arm length is 400. So, so we're going to stick at 400 and go to 300. Again, lerping using the zoom factor. So we go from 400 to 300 smoothly and evenly, depending on the zoom factor. Okay. <coughs> Let's read this little note. This code uses several hard coded values, like the half second and quarter second zoom times, the 90 degree zoomed out and 60 degree zoomed in field of view values and the 400 zoomed out and 300 zoomed in camera distances. Values like this should be generally should generally be exposed to the editor as variables tagged with U property edit anywhere so that non-programmers can change them or so that programmers can change them without recompiling code or even while playing the game in the editor. Ew. Interesting. I don't know how to do that though. How in the world do you do that? How do you make, well, let's try it out. Um, it would have to be in the header file, I would think. And we, let's just do some random variable. Um, we're gonna tag on the U property uh, with the edit anywhere. Uh, anywhere on there and um, I'll just put a float and um, we'll call it change this float. So we'll see if that pops up somewhere um, with respect to this pawn in the editor. Uh, so let's go back to here. Um, I'm assuming if we were to do this that we could use this um, float and we could like put it right here 
Uh, oh. Damn it. Press the wrong button. Hold on. Then we just put it right here. And we'd also put it right here. And then we could do something like this. For example. So that it zooms in 100 units. Um, but you might be far away or close depending on um, if that variable changed or not. But let's use the hard-coded values for now. Okay, so we'll see if that comes up later. Back to the tutorial. Uh, we're back in the tick. So we've only just done our zoom. We haven't done anything else yet. Which will turn our camera because we're attached. to it yes okay so instead of rotating like the sprain arm that has a camera attached to it around our actor we're just gonna rotate the actor itself and therefore the camera will change too so we're gonna take a F rotator um, vector I don't like calling it a vector, even though that's what it is. It's just a different purpose. Let me see. They just give the uh, F rotator pitch yaw and roll. It also has a zero rotator. Interesting. Okay. Just curious as how this engine actually works internally. So I'm gonna get the current actor's the actor's current rotation in the uh, world units. I guess we'll well it's the absolute rotation, I guess. That's a way to put it. So we set it to new rotation, and then we just change new rotation by adding on uh, how much the camera has changed. Um, and I'm pretty sure camera input this vector was changed down here. So, um, you know, basically when our mouse moves, our binding picks that up and calls pitch or yaw camera. It'll change X and Y accordingly. And then each tick will update um, the new rotation by reading the um, the vector that we set up. So now we can set the actor's rotation uh, using the uh, to say if it's um, let's just clean most of the notes. All right. I mean, since it's the actor, it doesn't really have like a relative rotation. Since actors aren't really attached to anything, they're individual units in the level. Um, if you were to, like, I don't know if we can do this. Yep, yeah, got uh, our camera. Green arm. Um, there's a set rotation. But there's the set world rotation which will set the rotation based on the world units, the X, Y, and, you know, Z, and those um, units. There's also a relative ro rotation, so we can rotate around our root component um, relatively. So if we wanted to move, uh, you know, like to five degrees out from our actor, um, if our actor was facing 30 degrees in the world, the relative rotation would then go to 35, is that what I said? 25, 35? I forgot what I said. But yeah. Uh, the actor does not have a relative look rotation. It is in the world, so it has world rotation. Or absolute rotation. Not relative. 
rotate our camera. Pitch. So we're doing the same thing, but for pitch. Type this out so I can kind of understand it more. I need to get a little bit better at my camera manipulation. I've just learned how to do this kind of stuff. Component rotation. Okay, so this is different. Um, all right, because we gave our um, screen arm a certain rotation up, and that's pitch. Uh, the yaw was zero so it's already behind looking like I guess behind I guess I guess it'd be kind of behind yeah behind the actor so it had a zero yaw anyway so we don't need to get the rotation of that um, it's you know based purely on the actor rotation but since we added on was it 60 negative 60 degrees rotation on the camera screen arm Right here, um, need to make sure we grab that first. Basically, we can't rely on the actor's rotation. Yes. Right. Plus, we don't want to. We're not going to set the actor's rotation too. That's a good thing to note. Um, so yaw is just, um, you know, if you have your character in the world, um, yaw is just turning, whereas pitch is looking up and down. Turning the character left and right is fine, but changing the up and down angle of your actor is probably not a good idea. Unless you're doing like a plane simulator, then sure, do that. But a character walking around, he's not going to all of a sudden... You know, if you look down, he's not going to lie down on the ground face down. So you don't want to rotate him. It's also why we're only dealing with the camera spring arm rotation. So I'm going to take the pitch. And we're going to set it to the result of a clamp operation. Because we're going to just add on. What are we adding on? We're adding on our um, sword value from the, the pitch camera function below. Um, since we changed the Y in there. And we're going to clamp it between negative uh, 80. So we don't look any further than that. Downwards. And we don't want to look up any further than negative 15 degrees down. So right, yeah. Um, I guess I could show that off real quick. Just so I can understand it. So um, this is using our old pawn where we can't control it. What is this camera doing here? Oh, I set up pawn. Um, So you can even see the screen arm in action already. I didn't know it did that. You can um, see how it legs behind. It'll follow. Um, it also hit um, collision. So if you're you know back up against a wall, um, the camera won't be looking in the back end of the wall. It'll move closer to your actor, so it can um, stay within view of it. Um, but since we're at negative sixty degrees. Um, you can see the line. Uh, let's select our screen arm. So that's the position of our screen arm. And it's got a 400 uh, units up to the camera's position. Um, but basically, if you look at it, um, the um, this degrees, um, it goes 
clockwise. Um, can we, uh, rotate. Yeah, so um, this will be zero normally. And you can see on my... Um, hold on, let me turn off Firefox. Um, you can see um, when, when the camera is flat, it's got 60 degrees. Um, so that's why we went negative 60 degrees. Now we're up here. Um, if we were to change the angle, um, like we have been in this clamp operation, it goes from negative 80 to negative 15. Um, so negative 15 would be, um, you know, halfway in between there. If I were to five there, um, gonna be right here. This will be the lowest we can get on our camera. Let me shift that so we're not on top of that real quick. Um, so yeah, you can see on this little camera that that's what our view would be. Um, it'd be pretty low. Um, otherwise, um, that's the lowest we can go. Um, the highest we'll be able to turn it to is 80. So you can see in the um, preview that it is uh, pretty pretty much top down at that point. Yeah, there you go. But it, it, it'll default to um, 60. 60 degrees up. All right. All right, let's finish that up. Um, <coughs> so now that we have clamped it to, to be within those values, let's set the spring arms rotation. Again, we're setting the world rotation because we don't want to set um, the rotation with respect to the um, actor, to which is well the the root component um, that it's connected to. We don't want to rotate around that because um, you know if our actor changes rotation, then um, well, I guess is this this is a relative location. So you know it starts out at zero degrees. Um, so we set the relative location, so it's six, negative six, well, 60 degrees above um, the uh, root component. Um, but I don't, I'm trying to think, and um, in this case, in this very case, the relative rotation and the world rotation are the same um, for right now. But if we were to rotate our um, our root component up and down using the pitch, um, then our relative and world rotation would be out of sync. So um, since our camera is probably going to want to be independent of rotations of our actor, if there are any, or I keep saying actor, of our root component, because we're connected to the root component, um, we want to ignore those and basically we want to view the world using this camera so we want to stay a constant rotation um, I can show you an example of where that went wrong um, I was trying out um, another tutorial um, and I have um, uh, let's give this something to look at just gonna slap on some clay material onto it so we can see it um, this is basically my concept just to use a ball to roll around in the world and I have the same setup pretty much here uh, with a spring arm that I, I put on a, a box basically on the spring arm just to see where it is and uh, a camera attached to the end of the spring arm so if we move this around it we see a legs behind and it snaps in uh, but basically I want to put physics on the ball so that um, it rolls around like an actual ball or a marble wood um, but when we play it 
Um, I don't think I have mouse. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, I changed the name of it. That's right. Uh, let's set that up real quick. Just so I can show it. Show it off. Let's turn off Firefox too. Go to inputs. And uh, I'm going to add uh, new ones on here. Because I changed the name of my camera controls. They're not the same anymore. But it's pretty simple. That was mouse X. And then we have move Y. Which is mouse Y. Now we should be able to control it. No? Okay. Hold on. Gliding pawn. What are your controls? So we, we bound to turn X and turn Y. Not move X, move Y. I'm an idiot. Of course it would be. Um... Because these were move X and move Y. So let's just uh, turn X and then turn Y. I've got this. Now we have mouse control. So um, this is how it should behave, basically. Um, and you can also see the back end of my box that I used to, to, uh, to show where the screen arm kind of is. Um, but since I applied physics onto this ball, um, when we hit this ramp, my ball's gonna roll down. But uh, so does my camera controls. So now we're just kind of looking everywhere, every which way at once. Also, my movement isn't that great. Uh, and since we're always rolling, the controls are just really weird. This is me pressing my mouse up and down. This is up and down, left and right. Basically, our rotation in the world got really screwed up because our ball changed uh, changed its rotation, which is what we're connected to. So um, that's what happens when your um, world and uh, relative locations get uh, out of sync. So we'll just... Uh, Delete that climbing pawn. Uh, and we'll just put in our other guy for now. Alright, back to business. Alright, so now we've set up. Uh, let me just, let's just test something out there. Uh, where's our tick? Did I pass it? Am I blind? This is the wrong file. Sure. All right. So that's why I was in that conversation because we we're setting the world rotation. Uh, so these kind of controls, I think, would avoid what I'm. Well, pretty much, I think, pretty much avoid what I was doing in that uh, class. Whew. All right. Um, so now this block well let's see what the turret has to say so this block right here uh, of code rotates our pawn's yaw directly with the mouse's x-axis not this block this block um, but only the camera system responds to the pitch changes right here from the mouse's y-axis rotating any actor or actor subclass actually rotates the root level component so we set the root level component and it actually rotates with the yaw. Um, so that's why it indirectly affects everything attached to it. This is why, again, we didn't uh, do the active rotation because we didn't want the root component to change. Um, so the next block of code should be the last is the actual movement of the character in the space. So we have the move X and move Y axes. Is that right?
That doesn't seem right. Yeah, we have move forward and move right. I think this, uh... This tutorial was, uh, wrong. <laughs> um, they were using... Search, uh, they were using the, um, input names from the, uh, the previous tutorial or something like that. Um, so we set up a block. We have an if statement. So for our stored movement vector, um, has a vector in it, and it's not just zero, um, then we shall actually move our character. So basically this only will be called if we want to move our character. Okay, so movement input. So um, our vector uh, only has values of um, uh, negative one to one. You know, for like the move forward is negative one is backwards, moving forward is one is, uh, yeah, forward is one, backwards is negative one. Um, but since we want to move faster than that in the actual world, uh, we're going to give it a velocity. So we're going to scale our vector's input. Well, the movement input vector based on that. Right. And then they have a new function that I haven't seen here. Um, say normal. So they're calculating the normal of the vector. Okay, yeah, so, uh, I'll see if it's in here. If it'll even come up, Dr. Normal. Um, yeah. Well, the normal vector of a surface, uh, they're talking about perpendicular. Um, yeah, see that, that this is this is why vectors are confused. Um, so basically, basically, to go into math here, let's, let's get a little zoomed in here. Um, a vector is made up of in 3D space, well, we're doing 2D space, we'll stick with 2D. It has two dimensions, basically two numbers with it. Um, and the thing is we have the vector norm, which is a length of a vector. So basically in 2D space, um, we have a plane. So let's say we ignore our X right here. You know, we just have Z and Y. That's our 2D plane. We're looking at a piece of paper. Um, and we're going from this point to this point, we can calculate a length between this x and y, well not this x and y, but um, this is where it's confusing again. Um, our vectors is gonna be, um, basically it, it'll start at zero and it goes from zero to a number, a combination number. So if z is one and y is one as well, the um, vector will look like an arrow going this way, you know, perfectly, perfectly diagonally this way. Um, but that vector will have a length. Um, so let's say Z is zero. So we're not going up at all, but Y is one. Then the length of our vector is just going to be one because we're just a flat line this way. And then you can see why, um, if we're at one Y here and we go up Z one, um, the length is not going to be one. Um, it's going to be more than one. And to be exact, it's going to be uh, the square root of two. That's going to be the value of uh, the length, the, unit, the vector norm. So we're not necessarily getting the vector norm. We're doing the normalized vector, I think, sort of.
Kind of. Are we? I don't know anymore. Then there's the normal vector, which is a perpendicular vector. So basically, if you take a plane, um, like a piece of paper, there's going to be a direction that is perpendicular to that uh, paper. Um, so if you put the paper on a desk, the normal vector, which is perpendicular to uh, the dimensions of the paper, is going to be straight up off the desk, coming up. Um, if you tilt that paper towards you, then the vector, normal vector starts uh, tilting towards you. So that's not really anything that we need to worry about. Um, it's probably still used in um, game development, but it's probably used to do with reflections because if a light, you know, comes off, you know, at a certain angle, it's going to be a certain angle with respect to the normal vector. And then you can calculate reflection values off that difference. And it's probably a whole thing. We don't need to get into that. Then there's normalized vector, which means the vector is taken from its values and shortened down into a single unit, basically one. So let's say uh, we have a vector of um, four in the y direction and two in the z direction. If we normalize that vector, that basically means um, y would be one and z would be a half because on a, on a normalized vector um, the most you can get is one so the ratios of the other um, components of that vector would be reduced to the appropriate ratio so if we went from four to one and from two to half since two is half of four anyways um, but you would see that if you were to draw out a vector like that um, you know, you go up, out four, and then up two. You know, it'd be kind of like a flatter arrow towards this way. And if you were to normalize that, it would have the same angle, but it'd just be like a little bit shorter. You know, if you go down one and then half, it'll still be the same direction as the previous one. It's just going to end up shorter. But that's how um, you can kind of reduce uh, vectors to a, a normal level that you would see and you could handle them especially like that so that's a whole that's a whole thing now a, a normal of a certain vector um, what would that mean um, Mm. Oh, is it a? Let's let's look at the math. Let's get real deep into this. Um, so it has a tolerance. We're not really going to care about that. Um, what we want to know is what uh, the uh, actual vector will return. Um, so if a square sum so it's going to do the Pythagorean theorem of uh, if you want to calculate a right angled um, triangle and you want to find well you want to find the length of the hypotenuse uh, you do um, the first side squared plus the second side squared and that'll equal the length well that'll equal the square of your hypotenuse let's just let's just get into it uh, how, how do you spell his name did I get that right holy crap um, images view image that does nothing for me well, you can see it visualize. No, you can't. Not, not really, actually. <laughs> but the idea is um, the area of a square is its length squared. So A times A is going to equal the area of this one. And then the area of uh, this B square, you know, B times B, is going to be this. If you add them up, it's going to equal the same area of this big square. That's it visualized. Uh, whoops. 
so yeah, it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's the typical um, way it's written out. So that's what we're doing here. Um, x is a, a squared, y is b, so we do b squared, and that equals uh, c squared, square sum. Um, so I guess I'm just checking to see if the uh, area of, or not the area, but um, the square of the length of the vector is bigger than the tolerance. Um, otherwise, they do um, scale. So they're normalizing it, I think. Because invert square. So yeah, okay. So right here, they're calculating the length. Is that right? Wait, what's going on here? Invert square. I'm trying to do math here. It's been a while since I've done math. So... Let's, let's do some math. Right. So let's say... Um, let's say X and Y are 1. Alright. So we're moving forward and we're moving right. All the way. Um, so then our square sum is going to be... Uh, 1 squared plus 1 squared. Which is just going to be 1 plus 1. And that's going to be 2. So our square sum is going to be 2. Um, an inverse square is a 2 to the negative 2. No, hold on. I don't know why I pressed that. 2 to the negative 2. Okay, so I, I remember now. Does this make sense? This doesn't make sense. Wait. Wait, does it make sense? It does make sense. Does it make sense? 0.25. No, it doesn't make sense. What's 0.25 squared? That doesn't make sense. Have I I'm I'm confused. Why have I been why is my brain broken? Math. Okay, uh, invert square root. No, square root. Square root. I read this wrong. It says square root. So, stop it. So it's not, not 2 to the negative 2. It's well, inverse square root. So it's going to be 2 to the uh, negative one over one over two. Oh. Please, please. There we go. Right. Wait. Yeah. Okay. So basically what we've done <laughs> to sum it all up, um, what we're doing here, we're doing 1 plus 1. No, wait. Let's, let's do it for real. 1 to the 2 plus 1 to the 2. Assuming that x is 1 and y is 1. So our movement is 1 and 1. Um, Pythagoras theorem. So that square sum is 2. Then we're going to invert square. It. So invert basically means we're going to take this and we're going to do 1 over 2. 1 over, one over 2. I don't know why uh, Firefox just likes to open up a find thing. Doing one over two, um, not one over two, one over the square root of two. Uh, so two up by the power of one divided by two. No wait, stop it. And it's done it again. It's just like quick find. I don't want to do a quick find. One. Okay. 
so yeah, you see this? My uh, forward slash key is opening up a quick find thing. We're gonna we're gonna nip that in the bud, right here, right now. How? How? Firefox, help me out. This is not helping. <laughs> General, uh, where are the advanced settings? I don't see any advanced settings. Uh, let's keep on it. Wait, you mean I have to cuss my keyboard? I have to open up that? No. Okay, look. Let's do. Um. This is like the developer's wiki. This doesn't help. Look at this guy trying to pass on the Internet Explorer or Edge as I call it. Anyways. I guess we're gonna have to slap on an extension. Hope it works. That's a lot. That's a lot of permissions. Omnibar replacement extension. What the? F Anyways. Can I search for a key binding? Oh, find. Really? Okay. That's cool. How about that? No? What the? I don't know how Firefox works anymore. You know what? What if we just here? Let me let me try something out. No, I try to use the numpad and it still brings up this stupid menu. Anyways, we'll deal with it. Whatever. Get out of here. Uh, not thirty-two, two. Okay. So the inverse square root. The inverse part is where we put the square root underneath a one. And the square root is this 1 over 2 part here to the power as an exponent. That's how you display exponent or square roots as an exponent. So this is our scale. All right. So this is, I think this is normalizing the vector. That's what we described before. This is the normalizing vector process. I may have described the normalization process incorrectly because what we're doing is we're making sure that um, the length of the vector is no greater than um, than one. So if we scale uh, the numbers based on this uh, number over here, um, for example, if we do you know one times this number, we're just going to end up with this number. Um, so in this case, x is 1 and y is 1, they're both going to be this number. 
But what would be the um, the length of the vector then if we were to have the scale on there? Well, all we need to do is um, let me copy this number. It'd be this number uh, squared plus this number, this, this number, this, this number, this number. Uh, it'd be, <laughs> why can't Google just do what I want it to do? Six, seven, eight, one, one, eight. Um, like that would be our Y component. So this would be like our X component squared, our Y component squared. This will equal our square sum. See where this is going? Our square sum is one. So if we square root one, we end up with one. So the length of the vector is gonna be one. It's not gonna be greater than one ever. That's the goal of normalizing a vector. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it's been a while since I've dealt with vectors. Probably like three years. Um, that was like one computer graphics uh, class. So that's what that is. Uh, that's the nitty gritty details of how this works. <laughs> I'm glad I know now though, what a safe normal is. I'm assuming it's safe because it uses a tolerance, maybe, or something, I don't know. Anyways, um, so this will normalize the vector so that it's not bigger than one and the X and Y components of the vector uh, will be scaled up to 100. So, um, if you were to use like a gamepad, for instance, and you had your um, thumbstick out, um, no matter which direction you push the thumbstick in, you're always moving at most 100 units per second. Even though the X and Y components will vary, you know, a lot uh, in terms of velocity. Again, nitty gritty details, which we don't really need to know, but it's really interesting how game engines work. Just be thankful we don't have to do any like rasterization or anything like that. All right, so we're getting the actor's location in the world and we're gonna add on based on these, this new normalized vector. Trying to process in my brain why we are getting the actor's forward vector. Oh, wait. Wait, wait. No, hold on. Wait. Yes, it's because um, we can turn our actor, you know, facing left or right with our camera. Um, so the forward vector will tell us which direction we're paint or facing in the world. Uh, so if we multiply that vector by our X component, our forward, well, don't think of it as X in the world. It's just our forward input, our W input. So we're moving forward, not necessarily along the world's X component. It's a weird stipulation. Like if you're just making like a 2D game with a fixed camera, uh, you probably wouldn't need to get like the forward vector. You could just um, assume that um, if you press W on like a side scroller game, you know, it means jump. Um, D is going to be right always. And A is going to be left all the time. You know, you don't have to worry about your actor turning around and uh, which way is the right way. Uh, but since we can turn our actor in three dimensions, it's a bit more important to know which way our actor is facing. So now we just need to do it with the right uh, vector. So we know basically this is like strafing, um, how much to strafe right and left based on our move right input. 
which is assigned to y, basically. And again, we're doing that over a certain time. So, um, you know, this is a velocity. Um, so this is velocity. Uh, let's just use meters, for example. I think it, they use actually centimeters for their measurement, but we'll just say meters. So this is um, 100 meters per second to find up here, 100 meters per second. And this is time in seconds. So, you know, if it's half a second, um, then we're going to move a certain amount in that half second. Um, but to make sure, well, to make it clear what we're doing, um, meters per second in math is uh, meters over seconds. And if you multiply by seconds, uh, that meters over second, um, the seconds will cancel. Um, you know, to show what that looks like. It could be like... Um, meters per second times it by second seconds um, and that basically eaters equals just meters um, so if you're at a velocity of five meters per second um, if you multiply by two seconds you'll get 10 meters uh, that's basic physics um, so basically uh, we're getting the amount of distance we want to move um, and since this right vector is going to be normalized um, I think it, yeah I think it's gonna be normalized within um, the world's coordinates um, we can tell how far away from our actor um, to move um, since our movement is just basically we're picking up our actor and putting it in that position but since our ticks are um, really quickly uh well really quick um that it, it look like s that our character is moving smoothly even though we're picking it up from this old location and moving it to a new location that's the way i see it in my head um which is important to know because if all of a sudden your game starts lagging and the time between frames is really long but you're moving at a really high velocity all, all of a sudden um, this distance that you calculate here will be really big so if all of a sudden um, your game legs but you're up against a wall and you're moving really quickly um, well I guess you were moving really quickly before you hit the wall then your the game will calculate your new location but it might be past the bounds of the wall so that's how um, you can sometimes walk through walls in games. Is if maybe like it lags or you're moving way too quickly, then the distance it calculates for that frame is going to be past a certain location that the game develop the designers don't want you to be at. Usually, there are ways around that in um, this. Um, you can make a movement component, which will be a child of a pawn. Um, so it'll basically get slapped on um, as a normal component, but it's called like a pawn movement component or something like that. Uh, and there's a function in there to, um, I think they say slide um, actor or something like that. Um, so it'll check every point, basically every point within your new location to make sure that it's safe to be there um, but if you're gonna be colliding with a wall then you can't slide any further um, and that can be useful for uh, sliding around um, actual um, other actors in your game or geometry in your game that might be blocking the character and even though if they press forward and they can't, they'll slide along that wall, um, you know, depending on their angle with that wall and stuff like that. It'll do the math for you. So, um, so using, uh, look at that tutorial, using get actor forward vector and get actor right vector allows us to move relative to the direction the actor is facing. Since the camera faces the same way as the actor, this ensures that our forward key is always forward relative to what the player sees. 
This is another another problem I had with my previous um, player, uh, where it was moving forward in the world's coordinates, but if I turn my camera, I couldn't um, move forward where the camera was facing forward. So that was a problem. All right. Um, apparently in step five we have finished coding. We can now compile our code. Get that started off. Um, and drag an instance of our new class from the content browser into the level ed editor window using the Unreal or inside the Unreal Engine editor. Now, yeah, so let's check how the build is going. Do, 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 do. Uh, warning safe normal deprecated due to unclear name. Use git safe normal instead. Okay. Otherwise, your project will not compile. So, yeah, there are some things that are deprecated over time, meaning that um, they're put out of use in place of other things. Um, so, yeah, they just renamed the git or they renamed the safe normal function to git safe normal since it is uh, more clear that you are getting the normalized vector. That's just a warning. So, our build succeeded. So now we can move to. Um, to our game. Uh, what I've experienced with code based components is that you need to delete the old uh, pawn and place a new one in there for the changes to be affected. I've seen it where it, it doesn't need to do that, but um, I always feel safer just deleting it and, and uh, play these, placing a new one. Um, so let's um, add a component onto our root. Uh, let's do a. Should we do? Let's just do a sphere. That's fun. Um, visual sphere. And uh, we have a static mesh. Let's give it a material. Um, let's do this ground moss. Sure. And we need to change its relative location. Uh, Z, let's try um, 50, 40, I think that looks okay, nope, 45, well, let's just go with 50, why not, yeah, you can see it uses like centimeter, oh, no, you can't, because Firefox is over, um, so I'm just editing, uh, I added the materials over here on the visual sphere, and I have that. I have changed the location up 50 uh, centimeters. Um, let's see if that works. And so there's our camera controls. Um, you can see that if I press or move my mouse up, that the camera stops it from going any lower. See so with going up. I can't go up any further than this. Um, I can move forward if I'm holding W and I change camera. Uh, my, ca uh, my pawn goes where my camera points. Um, all directions work. I can zoom in, which changes the FOV and the distance. Um, I don't collide because um, I haven't set collision on this. Um, you could um. Let's let, let's see what we can do. Um, we have the visual sphere. I wonder if we add collision onto this. If um, is there collision on this? Block all dynamic. Block all dynamic. Blocks all actors by default. Uh, block all. I don't know if this is right. Um, I guess what we could do. Uh, can we add like a collision sphere? Sure, we could. I 
Because right now our, um, well, our root component is just a scene component, which is basically nothing. It's like an empty component. Uh, so it doesn't have physics at all, you know, it doesn't have anything to collide with. It doesn't have a shape to collide with. Um, so that's why we can just move through things. Um, let's see what, yeah, feel free to add a static meshes, uh, which is what we've already done with the sphere. Sphere? Um, or other visual component or play without one. You should feel a smooth acceleration deceleration to your camera's movement as it follows you around the level but your rotation should feel tight and instantaneous. Try changing some of the properties on the screen arm component to see how they affect the feel of your controls, such as adding camera rotation leg or increasing or decreasing camera leg. Uh, let's see, our screen arm. For some reason, it likes to open up my folders again. Uh, so we have our screen arm, and we have, can I change what's on this toolbar? I don't think I can, because I don't need source control open. Anyways, um, player, palm with camera, camera screen arm, uh, so I can play around in here. Um, so that's our normal standard stuff. Let's see what happens if I put it to 200. Nothing. Um, I wonder if um, it just updated because of our zoom setting. Yeah, it doesn't seem to want to change. Brain arm. Uh, can I change it? No. You can see that preview wants to change, but the game doesn't actually change. Um, what does socket offset do? Oh, that is that's too much. Uh, zero. What does Z change? So that's moving it up off the, uh, <laughs> off the, um, our little sphere. Let's bring it back down. You know, if you want to have your camera really high up above your character, you can do this. Um, also helps to maybe avoid wall collision. You see, it still happens here because we're really close to the wall. But since we're kind of higher up, you know, it doesn't happen here. I guess if you were to decrease it, it might hit the wall again. Yeah, so at zero it hits the wall again. You have to look up over the wall, so. There's some benefits to changing the socket place. Um, how does changing the target offset change things? I forget which one is which. So is the target the camera? I think it is. So I think, wait, no, well, socket. I think the socket is the camera. The target must be what we're attached to, which is the um, root component, maybe. Let's reset these. We have probe size. Don't know what that means. I wonder if that's how big the, um, so is that 16? Um, how big for the, uh, camera's bouncing thing is, or, um, the wall detection is. It'll say, uh, one. Does it seem tighter? Maybe? And if we were to do something ridiculous like 80. What has that done? That might have been too much. Uh, we might be inside the sphere right now. <laughs> Still too much. 40. There we go. 
so yeah, that seems to change um, how close a collision needs to be to the camera's path to the actor. So if we sit right here, um, you can see where the wall is basically underneath the spheres the position right now, but we're still hitting the wall. Um, so if we change this to uh, one, for example, uh, we should be able to get lower. So now you can see the wall is almost halfway to this here, and we can actually go down all the way down and not hit the wall. But we move back, so it's just like a bit more accurate, I guess. Or if you wanted the um, camera to not get close to walls like that to prevent any obscuring, you can make it bigger, like 20. It's like, you know, allows you to keep full visual of your, um, of your character. Oh, there's a whole bunch of settings for that. Um... Like, see now you can see how uncharacteristic the camera is without the leg. The sphere looks like you know it's like centered in the picture perfectly. Doesn't even look like it's moving. It looks like the world is moving around it, kind of thing. Um, but if we put that back on, I can see it's like I the camera has to follow the uh, the sphere now. Enable camera rotation leg. So there's that. So if you want to watch your character turn, um, since we're actually turning the actor rather than the camera, um, and the camera's rotation, the yaw is based on the actor, we are able to see this rotation leg. Interesting. I don't know what the debug leg marker is. We change this to five. Is this a bigger leg? Zero is instant. High values are faster, less leg. Lower values are slower. So this is a really slow camera. Now I'm trying to think. Um, there are some like fixed cameras, fixed camera angles, not angles, positions in um, games. If you think of like Resident Evil, um, like they have a camera at the end of a hallway and the camera would kind of watch you as you walk by. You know, I'm trying to think of um, how something like this could be helpful in kind of creating that kind of feeling. Whereas like cameras like kind of slowly following you but it doesn't actually like focus on you completely. Okay, that's about it. Let me change. So on the um, again, again, stop this. Uh, on the tutorial, they um, they set up their uh, their, their uh, sphere, or not sphere, but their visual mesh, their static mesh with the cone, so they can see where it's pointing. And here's what the finished code looks like. This is the header file. Pretty easy, you know, input functions and variables for storing the input um, results, I guess. And we have some components here. They put them in protected. Uh, this can be, I guess it could be protected. Um, it doesn't need to be public. Um, it's just in terms of, you know, code neatness. People will debate that. We have our 
actual code. This is where a lot of the meat comes into play. That's about it for this one, I think. Now they would want us to give the player a run key to hold on to increase the pawn's movement speed. Oh, I forgot to check. Uh, we added in a variable. What's it called? Changeless float. I put in. Does this ever come into play? Uh, change this float. So let's check. It's not in the component list because it's not a component. And... I don't know if it would even like show up as in here. Open selection property matrix. So I hit that button. This is what came up. Change this float. So it's in there. <laughs> I'm not sure where in the editor it'll come up. I don't think it will. see if it pops up anywhere it does come up and it says pawn with camera okay for some reason it was underneath our camera spring arm but we can change the float <laughs> cool so if we wanted to assign this to our speed, you know, we could just go into here, you know, change it to a speed or a velocity. Um, so it didn't need to be a, uh, a it doesn't need to be hard coded to 100 uh, centimeters per second. It could be, you know, we could change it to 200, 300. Um, also, you know, if they wanted us to do um, like a sprint key, uh, we could put that in there too as a um, edit editable uh, variable. So we wanted to change our speed, our sprint speed, differently. Um, we could do that too, so it's not hard coded. Cool. Um, experiment with different ways to mix automatic and input-driven camera movement. This is a very deep area of game development with a lot of room to explore. Yeah, like I was thinking about the the Resident Evil stuff. Just thinking about how you'd have to have multiple cameras set up around um, your your level, and your actor will move in the world, but your like your cameras are all kind of looking towards you all at the same time, but only one camera is active at a time. I wonder how that's done. Um, increase, decrease, or remove the leg from your spring component to get a better understanding of how much leg. Can affect your camera's overall feel. We've done that. Implement a small amount of periodic motion, possibly slightly randomized, or using a curve asset to create a handheld feel to your camera. So if you want that shaky cam to make your uh, player sick, you could try to do that. Uh, give your camera some amount of automatic turning so that the camera gradually gets behind the player, moving player object and faces the direct... What? Give your camera some amount of automatic turning so that the camera gradually gets behind the moving player object and faces the, the direction the player is moving. Okay, so if they weren't face or moving directly forward, you could like slightly change. So it's like an auto focus or auto center. You know, I've played games with that before and it's definitely better to have an option for that than force it because having your view change automatically is sometimes pretty annoying in games. That's my that's my uh, opinion on that. All right. Um, can we go back to the tutorials? Uh, all right. So we did player-controlled cameras. Um, I might just do something simple like this. Uh, variables, times, and events. But um, after a break, I'm gonna take like a. 15 minute break, 20 minute break maybe. I'm gonna, um, I'll probably go to the bathroom, refresh my drinks. Probably gonna make some dinner too. 
it's getting close to five o'clock here um, so uh, I will actually just be right back <laughs> 